Very pleased to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Richard uh, Bullitt, who comes to us from Columbia University, where he's a professor of history and uh, has served as the director of the Middle East Institute at the School of uh, International and Public Affairs, where uh, he led that, uh, that organization for 12 years. He's also been on the faculty of Berkeley and Harvard. Uh, we were talking today, and, and I asked him, how, how does a young man from Rockford, Illinois, wind up being a professor at Columbia of, uh, of such uh, note? And uh, he told me that he was a specialist in uh, uh, odds, I won't say odd facts, but odds and ends and lots of things that nobody else knew. And, and at some point uh, got pointed towards uh, medieval Middle East uh, history and Arabic and, uh, and his distinguished career, which is outlined in your pamphlet, uh, followed, uh, followed all that. Uh, we also talked about uh, one of his uh, novels, and he's, he's written five novels in addition to his other scholarly works. Uh, but we're uh, extremely pleased that uh, Dr. Bullitt uh, was able to come to Nashville. Today he was at Hillsborough High School, and uh, over a 90-minute period, uh, he discussed uh, such a broad range of topics, I couldn't even begin to outline them here, other than to sum them up as being really an eye-opening uh, voyage into critical thinking for the high school students uh, at Hillsborough who had uh, the opportunity to uh, listen to him. And that's, that's really what the Tennessee World Affairs Council is about, is to bring these kinds of programs, especially to our uh, high school uh, uh, clientele, and whenever we have a speaker, we will endeavor to do that. But without uh, any further ado, let me uh, welcome to the podium uh, Dr. Richard Bullitt. Thank you, Pat. It's a pleasure to be here uh, this evening. Uh, my mother-in-law's family were from farm outside of Nashville, and uh, so I've been here once before meeting Ken on that side of the family. And on the uh, other side of the family, <clears throat> some of you may have heard of the uh, record label Bullet Records. Uh, that was one of my cousins who set that up as one of the first uh, uh, record companies to uh, record country music here in, in Nashville. Uh, so it's, you know, I feel real comfortable coming back to uh, uh, this sort of community, even though I've lived in New York now for a very long period of time. <clears throat> uh, I have so many things that I can talk about, and I want to encourage you uh, when we get uh, toward the end to feel free to ask any questions about the Middle East or the Muslim world uh, that, that you may have, and they don't have to be directly related to what I'm talking about. But essentially, since I'm going to talk about political changes, uh, I want to, you to think in terms of there being two <clears throat> simultaneous and interweaving uh, currents of change that have gone on in the Middle East uh, particularly in the Arab Spring, but with uh, antecedents that go back to the Algerian um, crisis of 1992 and back to the Iranian Revolution of 1979. Uh, one of those uh, currents is the, uh, the decay and then collapse of many governments. You know, why have they lost their support? Why have they lost their legitimacy? Um, and sometimes we have celebrated this loss of uh, legitimacy as when we had uh, popular uh, uprisings in uh, Egypt and uh, Libya and so forth in the Arab Spring. Sometimes we have deplored it as back in 1978 when you had a revolution in Iran with the same kind of, uh, of, of crowds. Um, I'll be arguing that the loss of support for regimes like the Shahs and like the uh, regime, say, of Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, uh, that there's a common theme in that, and that the change in, in attitude from an American point of view toward what is going on uh, has been more a change in the American outlook than a change in, uh, in what's happened. OK, the other current is the rise of Islamic political uh, expression. Uh, I think everyone is pretty much aware that in the Arab Spring, 
uh, you had a movement against regimes in power that was not necessarily for uh, an Islamic alternative, although it was for some people. Uh, for many Americans, it has been dismaying to find that uh, popular um, movements to overthrow oppressive regimes uh, have ended or are in the process of moving toward uh, these countries being under the, uh, uh, the governing aegis of Islamic political parties. I don't think this is something that we should be deeply concerned about from an American point of view, but nevertheless, I know that that concern is very, is very common in this country. So I want to talk about how these two things interweave. Why do existing governments collapse, and why has that collapse played to the benefit of the Muslim political uh, organizations? I want to start by talking about the Muslim organizations because uh, many people uh, have speculated on the uh, economic or social networking or political or other forces that were involved in the, uh, in, the in the collapse of, of Arab governments or the challenges to Arab governments. Uh, fewer people have been um, very skilled in talking about what has happened uh, among people of Muslim faith as they have responded to these things. And yet this is a very important uh, uh, part of it. And I'll have to go into it in, in, in some detail. Uh, let me start by saying that the people who pursue this interest in the United States, uh, people like me uh, who pursue it academically, were usually trained in area studies programs that began in the 1950s. And those programs produced really several thousand professors and specialists, um, some in government, some in military, some in business, NGOs, uh, who are now the sort of um, Middle East specialists uh, in the country. <clears throat> but area studies of the Middle East uh, were invented at that time, in the 1950s, out of whole cloth. We'd never done that before. And the, even thinking of the world in terms of, of areas that should be studied, South Asia, Latin America, Middle East, uh, was a pretty much a new idea coming out of World War II. Uh, and it represented a anticipation on the part of the people who were uh, directing international affairs at the highest levels uh, following World War II, that in the post-war world, the United States would have global responsibilities and would need global knowledge in order to uh, carry out those responsibilities. The problem was that this conception was uh, directly related to the outbreak of the Cold War. So that thinking about the world, whether it was Latin America or East Asia, South America, Middle East, uh, or South Asia, the Middle East, tended to be uh, focused on the question of whose side will, the, will these people uh, be on in the struggle between uh, freedom and communism. In order to, uh, to think about this, you had new ideas that were put forward in the 50s and the 60s that focused um, very strongly on what it was that the, uh, the free world uh, had to offer uh, that was competitive with the communist world. And this came down very much to the question of economic growth, uh, free enterprise, free trade, um, a dynamic uh, vision of society in which we in the West were headed toward being the leaders of the modern world. So modernity was a part of this. And this gave rise to a very strong emphasis in the 1950s and 60s in what comes to be called uh, later modernization theory. Modernization theory <clears throat> maintained that over the course of the remainder of the 20th century and into the 21st century, the entire world is inevitably going to become modern. 
And the question is, whose model will they follow? Will they follow a Western model or will they follow a socialist communist model? And that meant there had to be some notion of what was the Western model. Um, modernization theory, uh, and I won't go into the details uh, on it, but one of the assumptions that it had was that the history of Europe in the 19th century and to some degree in the 18th century had a trajectory that the whole world would, would uh, blend in with over time. And that trajectory was to have a democratic, secular, capitalist society. Uh, it's the word secular that I want to focus on here. It was explicitly stated by many people who wrote about modernization theory that religion in the modern world uh, is inevitably going to become a private matter. Religion, they will not um, follow religious leaders in terms of the policies of their countries and so forth and so on. So when you moder had modernization theory applied to the Middle East <clears throat> by the people who were writing the most significant books in this country in the 1950s and 60s, and there were about eight or 10 of these people, um, one of the things that they taught was that Islam is of no relevance, that uh, you don't need to know anything about Islam because it will become like Methodists. Um, I'm, that's my background. Um, that is to say, uh, Methodists used to be really hard-nosed people who had a whole list of things you weren't supposed to do, and by the 1950s, they'd given up on most of that. And so the idea was that Islam would move from being um, an important part of people's lives to being really sort of a private uh, thing, you know, uh, go, go to your mosque on Sunday and have a potluck dinner afterwards. Um, well, the consequence of this was that between the end of World War II in 1945 and the, and the Iranian Revolution in 1979, <clears throat> the number of academic works, uh, books, written by American-trained scholars working on the Middle East that dealt with contemporary Muslim religion was three. There were two books written about the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and one written of the title of Islam in Egypt Today. No one studied contemporary Islam. We all studied classical Islam. We all said this is part of the tradition, part of the cultural background. We should know something about Islam. But the idea that contemporary Islam was important was not only uh, not stressed, but it was theoretically minimized because of this notion that in a modern world, uh, Islam, like Christianity, like Judaism, like Buddhism, will be of uh, no particular importance. So what happened was that we had literally hundreds of American graduate students working on, uh, on the Middle East, North Africa, uh, you know, South Asia, interested in Muslim populations who were going out into the field and spending a year or two or more um, studying their, their area of interest and never asking their own age mates what they were reading so that the most important books dealing with the recovery of Islam as a form of political expression were written in that period, 1945 to 1979, and no American was reading those books. But these were the books that created first the Iranian Revolution and ultimately that have fed into the, uh, the rise of Muslim political groups uh, in the Arab Spring. So this is a problem. Uh, we have uh, known very little about Islam, and uh, by the time um, <clears throat> it became apparent in the Iranian Revolution that Islam had not disappeared, that it was important, uh, we had very few people who had any clue as to where to go to find out about this. Not only that, but because of the, um, the adversarial nature of the Iranian Revolution that uh, surfaced in the, uh, in the hostage crisis, those people who began to study Islam at that time began to study it as um, 
uh, an attribute of, of an enemy. Uh, the Muslims, um, matter of fact, very th <clears throat> a view that was very popular uh, in 1980, 81, 82, um, was that Shiite Islam is revolutionary, suicidal, uh, fanatic, um, you know, totally against Western and American interests, but Sunni Islam, the majority version of Islam, uh, followed by about 90% of the Muslims in the world, that Sunni Islam was just fine. There never were any Sunni radicals who would overthrow governments or assassinate people or carry out terrorism. Well, this, of course, was, uh, you know, let's say proven wrong on 9-11, um, but was clearly wrong uh, uh, long before that. But people didn't know anything. And they particularly didn't know anything about Shiite Islam, but they didn't know anything about Sunni Islam either. So let me say, uh, talk briefly about, uh, particularly about Sunni Islam. Uh, the political theory that is um, built into uh, Sunni Islam, the majority form of Islam, in recent centuries, goes back to uh, medieval sources, but particularly, particularly it goes back to the uh, 13th century and its aftermath, which is the period when the Mongols conquered much of the uh, Muslim world. <clears throat> And the question that arose at that time was, um, Islam had created an empire uh, in which Muslim rulers ruled over a mixed population of Muslims and non-Muslims, but that dominion lay with, uh, with Islam because the rulers were Muslims, and therefore the legal system was the legal system of Islam to a large extent. So what would happen if you had Muslims being ruled by non-Muslims? Uh, that happened in the Middle East with the Mongols, then it happened uh, later on in Spain when the Christians reconquered Muslim Spain. It happened in the crusading uh, lands in the, uh, uh, in, in the 12th century. Um, so what happens when you have Muslims ruling over non-Muslims? And this was a great uh, ideological debate and by and large, the consensus that arose was that if the existing government is, uh, enforces or pays um, significant, uh, shows significant respect for Islamic law, no matter how minimal that respect may be, but if Islamic law is respected, then the government is legitimate and Muslims should be loyal to a Mongol ruler or a Christian ruler or a, um, any other ruler. Uh, because the ultimate underlying thought was that, um, and I'm talking about Muslim religious thinkers, was that anarchy is, is uh, the worst thing that can happen, that human societies need government. And if they don't have government, you have anarchy and a war of uh, all against all. This is more or less what you would have had, say, Thomas Hobbes uh, writing at the same time in Britain. Uh, and so you need to have a government. The problem they had was that they recognized that, um, as uh, Lord Acton famously put it, I don't know who Lord Acton was, but we always quote him, uh, that, ab that power uh, tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So there was a feeling that on one end you had anarchy, which is unacceptable, and the other end you had tyranny, which was equally unacceptable. Uh, this is something, again, you find in European political theory uh, rising out of the 17th uh, century. Uh, so you had to say, what is it that, that legitimizes government and yet... Um, does restrains people from uh, from living under tyrannical rule. Ultimately, in the West, the answer to that turned out to be uh, democracy. Uh, the will of the people 
will stand against the tendency of tyranny. This is the message of the uh, Declaration of Independence that uh, comes out of the French Revolution. It comes out of, uh, in so many other incidents in the history of the West. But in the history of Islam, the consensus of the uh, thinkers was that it is Islamic law that prevents uh, tyranny from becoming maximized. That every, unlike a Western theory of a divine right of kings, whereby God has appointed me, Louis XIV, as the uh, defender of Christendom and the Lord of the Fran the ruler of the French, and therefore I can do whatever I want. You never had a divine right of kings theory uh, in later Muslim political thought. Instead, you had the idea that every Muslim is subjected to the law of the faith. And it makes no difference whether that person is a sultan or a um, commander of some sort or a villager. Everyone is under the same law. <clears throat> now, the assumption of that, the unspoken assumption was that the law itself is not made by the government, that the law itself is partially uh, delivered by God uh, in the uh, in the Holy Quran and in the collection of the lore about the life and deeds and sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, but it also is based on the assumption that the people who will interpret the law are not government functionaries, that there is an independent body of religious interpretation that ultimately uh, decides what is part of the law. And that this independent group um, actually had <clears throat> financial independence. Now, did this work? Did Islamic law prevent tyranny? No. Uh, but for that matter, democracy hasn't prevented tyranny either. Um, it's, it's a theory. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that when we now are able to go back and look at the functioning of Islamic law from, say, the 16th century onward, where we begin to have detailed documents, what we can say is that everybody who lived in the society felt that they were getting justice when they went to an Islamic court. So we've had studies, for example, that will go through hundreds of court cases in which you have people who have grievances against a government official. Uh, who wins in the Islamic court? The government official who has the power or the, um, or, or the plaintiff who has a claim against the government? Turns out there's no favoritism for the government officials. If you have lawsuits between Muslims and Christians or between Muslims and Jews, is there a favoritism shown in the court for the Muslim uh, uh, party to the law, uh, to the legal dispute? No, it's pretty much equal. There was a, rightly or wrongly, there was a feeling that Islamic law, working through the existing court system, produced what people thought of as being justice. The ruler himself could be truly vile. Um, you know, he could, um, you know, cut the head off of his grand vizier or his lady friend and toss it in the Bosphorus and uh, nobody could stop him. I mean, you did have despotism, but it didn't undermine the respect and the reliance that people had upon Islam as a legal and educational system. Of course, you could say in this country that, that is it conceivable that you could have a president who would have a girlfriend in the closet outside the Oval Office um, and uh, disgrace himself as a result without undermining the American legal system. Well, yeah, no, we did that. We showed that nobody thought that uh, President Clinton's uh, misdeeds were, um, had anything to do with the American legal system. Similarly, historians who focus on the, on the tyranny of, of rulers um, often fail to grasp the fact that society was stable and uh, generally uh, quite supportive. 
a matter of fact, between, say, roughly, <clears throat> oh, 1500 and um, oh, 1850 or so, uh, the Middle East is one of the most peaceful parts of the world. Um, compared with Europe, which was um, the most bellicose uh, part of the world. I mean, Europe's great rise was accompanied by, and to some degree fueled by, almost continual warfare and massive loss of life. Whereas at a time when the Middle East was one of the most peaceful and supportive societies in the world. <clears throat> now, if you come down to the 19th century, and I'm sorry to put so much history in this, but I am a historian, so you're gonna get it anyway. Come down to the 19th century. Um, Christian rulers in Europe uh, had for many, many centuries felt that, that Islam was an enemy. Uh, we had views going back to the period of Crusades or going back to the very origin of Islam, and I won't get into all those things, but they felt that Islam was an enemy, and they would love to see Islam uh, diminished in its importance in the Muslim world. And they had great influence as great powers and as imperialist overlords in some area. And they also provided an interesting example. Uh, the example was that of Napoleon. Napoleon showed that you could have a national empire that did not have any religion connected with it, and that it could be the most powerful that anyone had ever seen. Uh, so that uh, whether people were Jews or Christians, they were citizens of France, and they would be uh, you know, drawn into the Napoleonic armies. When, Napoleon's, uh, when Napoleon invaded Egypt at the end of the 18th century, he sent out um, pamphlets saying that he was a Muslim and that uh, the French were coming to, uh, to save the Muslims from tyranny. Uh, it's all propaganda. But to some degree, Napoleon really believed that uh, an absolute secular state would maximize power. People in the Middle East, certain rulers, took that to heart, and they began to create um, new military and state structures based on the idea of becoming like a secular military uh, power state in European terms. This happened in Egypt, it happened in the Ottoman Empire, it happened to a, a much less effective degree in Iran. Um, but one of the things they had to do was to get rid of Islam because uh, what they were doing was increasing the tyranny of the state, increasing the power of the state, and Islam was standing in the way. So in the course of the 19th century, the educational system was changed to take the religious figures out of education for the most part. The legal system was changed to minimize the role of Islam. Uh, the financial power that was held by the Muslim religious figures was largely undermined in various ways. And there was a steady effort to reduce the importance of Islam in daily life and political life throughout the 19th century in the Middle East and North Africa. And that effort to reduce Islam was strongly reinforced and encouraged by Britain, France, Germany, and the uh, uh, Christian powers of Europe in general. Now, according to Muslim political theory, <clears throat> what should have happened uh, was that as you moved Islam out of the public arena, you should have an increase in tyranny because of this notion that the thing that keeps the necessary government in balance is Islamic law. So if you push it out, you should have an increase in tyranny. In fact, what happened was precisely that. You had an enormous increase in tyranny. By the 1950s, when you had newly independent countries uh, emerging after World War II, and to some degree earlier in countries like Egypt, um, you really had uh, dictatorships. Um, they were uh, clearly, uh, they said they were secular, but their notion of secular was not separation of church and state. Their notion of secular was total control of 
religion and minimizing of any role for religion in public affairs. So that in most countries, you would have every sermon every week throughout the country was written by a bureaucrat in the government. And the preachers had to preach that sermon because the government wanted control of everything. So that um, Islam was taken out of the public arena and put under the control of the state. And the state became, uh, rep became increasingly uh, dictatorial. Now, what should have happened <clears throat> in Islamic political theory is that as tyranny increases, there is a, almost a reflexive sentiment among Muslims who are experiencing tyrannical rule to turn toward Islam as the solution, um, as you would have in a Western country where people who feel that they are under a tyrannical regime of some sort, whether it's a sheriff in Arizona or a mayor in New York, people say, well, we'll get him in the next election uh, because we have mechanisms. Well, the mechanisms that people had developed in their thinking about Islam uh, were to look to the religious leadership for a way to combat tyranny. So what you should have had from the 1950s on was a movement against tyranny in the Muslim world, uh, spearheaded by people who were, in one way or another, uh, Muslim uh, religious leaders. What actually happened was precisely that. Whether it's the Muslim Brotherhood in Iran or any number of other similar related organizations elsewhere, Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, um, the rise of Islamic politics, what we now think of as the, re -ex uh, as the expression of, is of a uh, renewed political Islam, <clears throat> was not a result of Israel-Arab issues. It wasn't a result just of uh, anti-imperialism. Um, it was something that was built into the whole history of Islamic uh, thought and Islamic education. Now, there had been a change. Uh, so it was not simply a, uh, a new expression of things that had been around before. And that change had to do with, uh, with things that happened at the end of the 19th century, mainly the spread of the printing press, which had been around in Christian countries for hundreds of years, but had not been used that much in the Muslim world, particularly for religious texts. Um, and what happens when you start to teach through printed books that can be uh, reproduced in great numbers and um, made available throughout the Muslim world is that people's notion of education is no longer directly connected with the teacher in the classroom. You have the student, you have the teacher, and you have the book. And increasingly, the book becomes uh, important because when the, dicta when the dictatorships take hold, uh, particularly after World War II in the 1950s, uh, they want to control education. They want to mass education, but they want to control it. So they don't teach anybody about Islam in any very sophisticated way. So they were actually creating a literate, politically savvy uh, population of young people uh, at the same time that you had new books being written by Muslim leaders, who some of them self-appointed leaders. But these books had enormous impact. And the, uh, the movements we see today grow out of that period. And that, of course, is the period of the subject that Americans were not studying. So the result was you came down to 1979. And what we discovered uh, in this country was that um, everything we thought we knew was wrong. The uh, trauma of 1979 at a national basis was the hostage crisis. But in-house at a professional basis for people trying to understand uh, the contemporary Middle East, it was the failure of every theory that we had been espousing. Uh, for the previous uh, quarter century. Modernization theory said this couldn't happen. And you had some scholars who were in absolute denial. Uh, one of my colleagues at Columbia uh, wrote a book uh, 
uh, well, with his wife, right after the revolution, who explained that there was no religion in the Iranian revolution. That what you had was a fascist uh, revolution to establish a dictatorship, and that the Iranians were simply saying it was religious, it wasn't real. Uh, now you'd think, well, you'd think he would have learned over time that he was wrong, but he went on to become the architect of our war in Afghanistan, uh, our support for the Mujahideen groups there, then he became ambassador to Iraq, then ambassador to the United Nations. He was one of the most eminent of American foreign policy experts, as Almay Khalilzad. But he simply didn't believe that religion had anything to do with this. Why? Well, he was a political scientist from the University of Chicago. He had learned that the theory said there was no religion, and he was unwilling to look at the facts. To some degree, the unwillingness of people of that age group, um, to many degrees in my age group and people 10 years younger, to look at the facts on the ground has been an absolute catastrophe uh, because we, it has led us into uh, wars and campaigns of various sorts in which we have known virtually nothing about the people that we are identifying as our enemies, what motivates them, and how to, uh, how to deal with them. <clears throat> All right, so what I've, what I've done up to this point in this talk is try to explain that the Islamic political uh, phenomena that you see in the Middle East today are not recent, they are not um, uh, lightweight things that will, that will pass away, that they are there, they are the, 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 the core of a movement that has been going on for decades to try and bring representative government to countries that are uh, dictatorships. The revolution in Iran, uh, as I say, was totally unexpected. People did think there might be a revolution, but they thought it was going to be the communists taking over. Um, I, I recall being at the State Department in the spring of 77, and I was supposed to be there for a week to sort of uh, look at what the man on the Iran desk in the Intelligence and Research Division of the State Department was doing. I got, and I, I knew he wasn't doing much because he was my former student. And, um, but I got there, and on the first day, I said, you know, Frank, uh, what do you have on Ayatollah Khomeini? He said, I think we have a couple of pamphlets, but these files over here are the files about the Communist Party. That's the important thing. And I said, no, Frank, that's not the important thing. It's those pamphlets on Khomeini that are the important thing. And, um, and he disagreed. Um, then he went off to Kathmandu to become an uh, embassy official and was not replaced. At the time of the Iranian Revolution, the intelligence division of the U.S. Department of State did not have an Iran specialist covering the Iran desk. They actually had to call over to the Defense Intelligence Agency and say, do you have a military officer who you could send over to... Uh, Because theory said there shouldn't be a revolution. But then once you had it, um, then you had to deal with it. Uh, obviously, America did not shine in the way it dealt with it. Um, but more importantly than the American reaction, uh, perhaps was the reaction in the Muslim world. The reaction in the Muslim world was, those Muslims are going to overthrow us. This is the reaction of the dictators. Say, we have seen what's happened to the Shah, an absolute monarchy with a very powerful military and a huge internal security apparatus, and it still has been toppled by a religious revolution. So we have to double down and make sure that those Muslims are kept under control. So from 1979 on, on, pretty much every country um, uh, in the Muslim world, particularly in the Middle East and North Africa, began very vigorously to suppress uh, Islamic political uh, parties. 
uh, creating prison camps, prohibiting them from running for election, even, in, even though the elections were completely bogus. Uh, and yet, as this tyranny increased, people began to think more and more that maybe the Muslims were right. And so while they were suppressing them, they were also strengthening them. And they were leading crucial elements in this Islamic political arena to think that they might be able to get enough popular support to actually create uh, electoral uh, governments and actually run for office. Now, as long as that suppression continued, um, the dictatorships uh, remained in control. But the problem is that when you had Islamic leaders, leaders of Muslim parties, who were calling for elections and calling for an opening up of the political system, and when you have them being thrown into jail or driven into exile or their movements outlawed, for some people, for a very, very small fraction, <clears throat> it led them to become terrorists. They said, look, gradualism doesn't work. Uh, the government will never permit elections. We can never have a, um, uh, an expression of Islam in the public arena. So we must become assassins. We must become jihadists. And some people said, it isn't just the dictators, it's the people who support the dictators, and that meant the United States. And so you have the birth of, of uh, terrorism against the West. Now, there is an argument uh, that is um, out there saying that the Arab Spring uh, may be the biggest defeat for Islamic terrorism uh, that could be imagined. Because if you are living in a Muslim country, and after two generations or more of having no say whatsoever in your political life, suddenly the political system opens up and you have elections, you have a constitution, and people go out, get out of prison and are able to run for office. Well, maybe you don't have to become a terrorist. Maybe you can achieve a balancing of the system away from tyranny without going through a stage of extreme violence. Um, th that is my view and that is my hope, is that the opening up of systems in political systems in Muslim countries in the Arab Spring uh, is going to enormously diminish the recruitment in those countries for, uh, for terrorist groups. Um, now you might think that that's a, um, you know, a naive and optimistic vision, but I had a, a long conversation on the phone with a former student who's, uh, who's now in the National Security Council uh, dealing uh, you know, in the White House. And I said, well, this is my view. And he said, yeah, we agree with that. That we think that the Arab Spring is a huge defeat for Al-Qaeda and the other groups. Now, is it? Well, we don't know yet. Except that the main, it's interesting to see that the arena for the most recent terrorist uh, you know, surge has gone into countries that have not been part of the Arab Spring, particularly in Mali or Somalia and so forth. So the, uh, no, the jury is still out on that. But then you have the question of why did these regimes collapse? Because what, what I've tried to do is explain that why in the, in the um, that when they collapsed, the Muslim political parties have become so popular and have been able to move into uh, that vacuum. That really isn't why they collapsed, uh, because the, um, the Muslim political parties rarely took the lead in the demonstrations that led to the collapse of government in Tunisia and Egypt, uh, ultimately the collapse of government in Yemen and, and uh, Libya. Um, so why did they collapse? And here I'll, I'm going to make an argument that is perhaps less secure historically than the one I've just made, and it'll be also be briefer. Um, before the Arab Spring, there were eight Arab monarchies and there were eight Arab uh, officer states. I sometimes call them neo-Mamluk states. Uh, states where 
all of the benefits of government went to the officer corps, uh, basically government of, by, and for the officer corps. Sometimes the, this meant military officers, sometimes uh, internal security police, but basically they were officer states. Um, the countries that had officer governments saw a phenomenal involvement of the officer, uh, of the officers and their family uh, and their relatives and their friends in the economy. There's a story, which I think was actually true, although I haven't found a text on it, that there was an Egyptian general <clears throat> at one point who proposed to parliament that he be allowed to uh, sell chickens to the general public because he'd been growing chickens for the army. And he said that I can grow chickens cheaper than the chicken farmers in Egypt. And the chicken farmers resisted him in parliament and said, the reason you can grow them cheaper is that you're using draftees for all of your labor. And you're not paying, and draftees aren't paid anything, so of course you can be cheaper. He said, well, nevertheless, I'm producing cheap chickens. <laughs> um, you know, if you look at the family connections of the rulers and the second tier officials in these officer states, their hands are in every single business of significance in the country. And these are really sort of kleptocratic, crony capitalist. Uh, officer uh, regimes. What legitimized them, the reason people put up with them, was that they had an ideology, uh, very largely an ideology of Arab nationalism, that said we came into being uh, in opposition to our, to your enemies, you the people. Your enemies are Israel and the imperialists. Britain, France, now America. Um, we stand up for, uh, for the Arab nation vis-a-vis -vis these enemies. Well, this is a strong legitimizing, uh, leg legitimizing claim the, because they all came into power through revolutions of one sort or another. Uh, the Arab monarchies, on the other hand, the eight Arab monarchies all came into power through collaboration with the imperialists. Now, they're not revolutionary regimes. They were not nationalist regimes. They claim legitimacy based on the family uh, of, the ruling, uh, of the rulers. Now, the nationalist regimes for, let's say, from the 1950s, it was Egypt even longer, uh, down to 1991, uh, were fairly consistent in their claim to be defending against the Israelis and the um, and the imperialists, or as Osama bin Laden has it, the Crusaders and the Jews. Uh, but in 1991, um, because of very adroit and uh, very admirable leadership on the part of James Baker in formulating a, a, a follow-up to the Desert Storm War against Saddam Hussein, that brought the Arabs to the bargaining table with Israel in the Madrid conference of uh, late in 1991 that basically ended the state of war with Israel for the Arabs, not for the Iranians. They weren't part of the coalition, but for the Arabs. So Israel from that time on, in some cases in Jordan and Egypt you had treaties, but across the board, Israel sort of loses its primacy as the great cause uh, from the point of view of these dictatorial governments. Then you had, um, uh, after 9-11, you had the question of, will you help us against terrorism? Um, and every one of the dictatorships said, absolutely, uh, because those terrorists are religiously motivated and we're as frightened of them as, as you are. So from that time on, you had the support of the United States. Uh, you know, the, the United States enjoyed support from Libya, Egypt, um, you know, Syria, all sorts of Yemen countries were saying, look, feel free to, uh, to run your drones. Uh, we'll give you intelligence support. Have your CIA base here. Uh, we're on your side. Uh, 
And they also adopted the idea increasingly that Iran was the great enemy of the Arabs, uh, something that really made no sense except from an American and Israeli point of view, because Iran had no particular threat uh, to the Arab world. So what happened is that gradually, in, great, in a series of great successes for American foreign policy, the, the dictatorial officer regimes backed away from their uh, from Palestine and uh, their animosity toward Israel. And they backed away from anti-imperialism. And they became regimes that really we were in pretty good cooperative relationship with. The problem was that their street populations did not agree with this at all. The street populations remained anti-Israeli, became, um, uh, they didn't see uh, the legitimacy that the regimes had enjoyed, um, you know, vanished. And when you had a break that began in Tunisia, it was not surprising to see it spread. I actually published a speech in 1992 in which I predicted that there would be a year uh, in the not too distant future when all of the Arab regimes would collapse in the same year because of their loss of legitimacy combined with the power of the Islamic alternative. So you ended up having all of the officer regimes either falling or becoming endangered. The Syrian one is the last one. So that, that has maintained legitimacy better than any of the others. And the others have fallen. When they have fallen, they have fallen to genuine popular movements uh, that were not either instigated by or led by uh, Muslim political leadership. But as you move to elections, it is these Muslim parties that have served so many years in prison or in exile that are the people who are organized and uh, capable of uh, offering a new form of government. Now, what form of government do they offer? Because that, of course, is a great concern many Americans have. Um, in 1979, uh, after the Iranian Revolution, you had an Islamic Republic uh, set up in Iran. And um, there was enormous population, uh, popularity for Ayatollah Khomeini. You saw his posters, posters of his pic showing his face everywhere uh, in the Muslim world. In 2004, I believe it was, I was a co-organizer of a conference in Jordan uh, that was on the subject of Islam and elections. And the only people invited to the conference were Islamic political activists uh, or people who had served on uh, on um, electoral commissions in Muslim countries, um, or a few uh, Muslim academics. So I was kind of the only white bread American in the room. And uh, we had two days to talk about Islam and elections. There were people there from the Muslim Brotherhood, from the uh, Skiri and Dawa parties in Iraq, from, uh, from various organizations. Uh, there was an Ayatollah from Iran, and it was interesting because um, since, every, since there weren't any Americans in the room, uh, nobody wasted their time attacking Israel. Because, you know, they were all against Israel and they didn't, why waste their time on that? Because there was nobody to impress. And nobody wasted any time uh, condemning the American war in Iraq. I said, well, you know, there weren't, there weren't any Americans there to, to impress. So they actually talked for two days about Islam and elections. And in setting up the agenda for the meeting, I had set aside one uh, two-hour segment to talk about the idea of an Islamic republic. Not a single person wanted to talk on the subject. And when I raised it, um, I said, well, don't be interested in an Islamic republic. The Iranians have screwed it up so bad that this is a subtext. I'm not, they didn't say this literally. There were some 
uh, Iranians in the room. But, but basically what they're saying was the Iranians have tarnished the image of an Islamic Republic so badly that we don't want anything to do with it. The buzzword that they had was pluralism. So what we really need to have are free elections in which if we are elected, we will rule until the electorate decides they want somebody else. Um, Iran had ceased to be the model that it had been in 1980. Uh, and to some degree, Turkey was emerging uh, and Malaysia as models of an alternative way in which you could have an open electoral system with both religious and non-religious parties where everybody would play uh, by the same rules. Now, of course, that could have been simply um, you know, feel-good talk from people who secretly in their heart of hearts intended to create dictatorships of a religious sort. And many people believe that that was the case. Uh, but why were they saying that to one another? Uh, you know, I, I remember a scholar from the Sudan who had just gotten out of prison uh, about three months before the meeting. And, um, and he said, look, my grandfather was a religious judge. My father was a religious, religious judge. I have credentials to be a religious judge that are equal to any person in this room from any country. It was very, very emotional about it. He said, and I'm telling you that there is not a single line in the International Declaration of Human Rights that is contrary to Islam. Um, well, this, um, you know, they were talking to one another. And so certainly, uh, you know, it, it, it's hard to, to prove that they were dissembling. But in any case, and I want to close with this, um, one thing that we have to keep in mind as we look at what's happening in the future and where things might go and what the implications are for the foreign policy of the United States and of uh, friends of the United States. Uh, one of the things um, uh, we have to keep in mind is that um, the Iranian revolution was a true revolution. And one of the, one of the, what I mean by that is that every military officer of the rank of colonel or general all of whom had been appointed by personal vetting by the Shah, either went into exile, or they were put on retirement, or they were killed. So that when the Iraqis attacked in 1980, uh, Iran could not fight the war above the battalion level. They had no officers who'd ever trained at a higher level of, of command to integrate at a division or multi-division level, and they had to create a completely new officer corps. But that new officer corps uh, was not made up of people who were part of the Shah's army. And the result is that in Iran, you got a completely new constitution and a completely new structure of government. But in the Arab Spring, which affected primarily the officer regimes, one of the things that we have to be aware of is that all the officers are still there, maybe not uh, the top person, but uh, there has been no elimination of, uh, of the officers. And the result is that you have a situation somewhat parallel to what you had in Turkey from 1950 on, in which you have a movement toward having open elections with civilian parties uh, striving for votes and producing civilian governments, and you have an officer corps in the background that stands ready to step in if they don't like what the civilian government is doing. Turkey had its first free elections in 1950. There's a coup in 60, a coup in 70, a coup in 80, an almost coup in 90, a abortive coup in 03, um, because the military has always felt that um, the civilians are getting out of control. But over that period of time, the civilian parties have learned how to govern and learned how to keep things in some kind of a, um, of a democratic balance. So that the current uh, Turkish government, which is, comes from an Islamic religious background, 
is probably the most, uh, certainly the most effective civilian government Turkey has, uh, has ever had. Uh, and appears to have the political skills and the ideological skills to maintain itself for, uh, for some period of time. Um, what I think will happen in Egypt, and you can take other examples as well, but in Egypt I think what we're going to find is that you get an electoral system under a new constitution in which you have civilian parties uh, running for office, in which the Muslims are going to dominate Muslim parties, primarily the Muslim Brotherhood, but that you're still going to have the officers there. Maybe not the most senior ones. Maybe they're, they're colleagues who are one step down, you know, the brigadiers instead of the lieutenant generals. Um, and my guess is that we'll have at least one coup in Egypt um, within the next 10 years. And maybe we'll, we'll further coups. But one thing that's been shown from the Iranian Revolution is that once people get used to voting, and once people get used to the notion of civilian government that they can elect, they really like it. And they change things simply through the, the pressure for the vote. So that having a coup in which the coup makers feel that they must return to civilian government as soon as possible is very different from the old officer regimes in which the officers would simply divvy up uh, the goodies among themselves generation after generation. So even though I think we are headed for a period of instability in the region and that these new regimes and new constitutions, new electoral systems are going to be tested in a variety of ways, uh, it may be good that the officers have not been thrown out entirely because it may be that we're going to have a kind of a balancing force that will, in the course of time, gradually lead to civilian governments, Muslim or non-Muslim that know how to govern, and finally, at long last, can bring to the Arab world the kind of, uh, of development, political, social, educational, economic, that they've been denied for generations uh, because of the existence of these tyrannical regimes. Thank you very much. Be happy to take any questions for as long as Pat will let me talk. Yes, sir. We just re-elected our president, and uh, let's assume he calls you into the Oval Office and says, Professor, what should we do in the Middle East in the next four years? What do you tell him? Um, a, do not go to war. Um, and I am um, totally apart from any other issues in the election. Um, I think that the re-election of President Obama has um, put the war with Iran on hold for an indefinite period of time. And I think that's a great boon, uh, regardless of what other uh, feelings one might have. <clears throat> and secondly, to, um, to recognize that uh, instability is not the same thing as, um, uh, as uh, hostility. And that if you have... Um, regimes that are fumbling their way ahead, um, well, all right, let them fumble. Uh, try and support the best um, tendencies, whether they are uh, espoused by religious or by non-religious groups, and try to discourage the worst tendencies. But in the Cold War, we had an obsession with stability because there's a feeling that the entire Middle East could become communist if even one country uh, was taken over by the Soviet Union. And stability was our uh, watchword. Um, so we tolerated, indeed, we supported dictatorships because they were a bulwark against the Soviet Union. That obsession with stability is not necessary today. Uh, Israel is strong enough to defend itself, particularly with American support against any enemy, whether, regardless of how unstable the Arab world is. Um, we have uh, a expectation of increased energy sources in this country, 
uh, and of continuing access to energy sources in the Middle East, regardless of stability or instability. Um, because the people who have the oil have to sell it, can't drink it. Um, and the result is that I think we have to, to get away from the, 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 the shibboleth that uh, instability is against the American interest. The, the Muslim world needs some instability. Uh, dictatorship is not good. Uh, and elections are not inevitably reliable in terms of producing a completely harmonious and effective result. I mean, one of the most extraordinary things uh, in our effort to create a democratic regime in Iraq was the, the whole parade of officials who went over from the United States to talk to the Iraqi leadership and said, OK, now you Shiites are dominant in the government, but you have to give, you have to listen to and sympathize with the Sunnis uh, and the Arabs and the Sunni Kurds in order to live in a community together. And you have to, you can't have a domination of the majority in that way that, um, that enemies of democracy have always feared. Then they would fly back to Washington and they would discover that without a 60 vote, uh, you know, majority in the Senate, absolutely nothing could be done in the United States because the Democrats would not give any uh, attention to what the Republicans wanted. The Republicans wouldn't give any attention to what the Democrats wanted. We, we were going to Iraq and saying, democracy calls for cooperation and working on both sides of the aisles, but we don't do it ourselves. And everybody knew that. And the hypocrisy of the American uh, pretense that we have gotten democracy really right and that in every election, the two most qualified people in the United States stand for office as president. You know, it isn't that simple. And it won't be that simple in the area. So I think that we have to be willing to, to, to uh, roll with the instability that, uh, that that's going to be inevitable for a period, I would say, of um, 20 to 50 years. Yes, sir? Um, what do you see as the uh, prospect for increasing sectarian tensions within the Middle East, uh, the idea that the Syrian uh, civil war uh, might unleash sectarian uh, violence? Uh, well, there, of course, there are two concerns about sectarianism. One is um, uh, intolerance uh, between Muslims and non-Muslims, and the other is um, uh, intolerance within the Muslim community between Sunnis, Shiites, or other, or, or other groups. Um, it is possible that this kind of, um, of uh, violence will become uh, uh, marked, but I don't really expect it to. I think that the degree to which uh, religion is now seen uh, as a doctrinal affair, as opposed to being an avenue for producing a more equitable um, uh, distribution of power and, uh, and government, uh, I think that we tend to exaggerate the doctrinal differences and that we have done so for, oh, you know, 75 years. Um, it was interesting that at the time of the Iraq War, one of the books that was most strongly recommended was a book by uh, Raphael Patai called, I think, The Golden Road, something like that, that talks about how in this tribalized world, it's always dog eat dog, and every group is going to fight for its um, uh, for its sectarian uh, uh, brethren. Um, that there have been few books in the entire area of Middle East studies that have been a, more strongly attacked than that particular book on the basis that it was a primarily uh, an ideological tract rather than a, uh, a genuine scholarly study. Uh, the fact of the matter is that Muslims have a very long history of getting along with one another and they have a very long history of getting along with non-Muslims. Uh, you can goad people into sectarian violence. Uh, it's very interesting to talk to people who were studying um, uh, Bosnia uh, 
uh, after the uh, breakup of Yugoslavia. And some people said, you know, these, the, the Christians and the Muslims in Bosnia have been living together for hundreds of years, and it was extremely difficult to get them to shoot their neighbors, and that it took deliberate atrocities uh, to create But that is the way people are. They really don't tend to want to shoot their neighbors. And I don't think that uh, powerful sectarian violence is on the horizon for the Middle East. Way in the back. Um, during the, uh, the, uh, the Arab Spring in, in Egypt, all the pundits were, were talking about how if they could just get the Egyptian army on the side of the the protesters, then all would be, you know, over for Mubarak. And I guess my uh, my question to you is: Can you clarify how is the how is the Egyptian army? What is their role to Egypt compared to our army's role to America? Because it seems like they had a lot more of a role in, in, in their daily life and society than we than our army has in America. Okay, um, I always refer, I've referred to these as officer regimes, and. Every army is divided between the officers and the other ranks. <clears throat> Egypt has a very large army, but mostly made up of people um, in lower ranks. Uh, the question that has been in the minds of many people for the last several years has been, if you ever really deployed the army generally uh, you know, in the country, would the soldiers actually shoot? So that in Syria, certain units are deployed regularly, but most of the army is not. In Libya, you had certain units that were deployed, uh, but others that were not, um, because you don't know whether the soldiers will obey orders. Now, in, in Egypt, um, I don't think the officers wanted to test that issue. So they decided, I think collectively, that they would leave the dealing with the protests entirely to the internal security police and that they would not participate. But at the same time, they were not going to allow their, uh, their soldiers to join in the protests either. They had enough command and control to, to keep them uh, in the barracks. Uh, when, you, when you don't have that command and control, uh, then you have a very difficult situation so that in the Iranian revolution, we actually had um, units that came out in favor of the revolution against their officers. And uh, that's what made part of what made Iran a real, uh, a real revolution. But I think that in the Arab Spring states, the concern for the officer corps has been overwhelmingly uh, maintenance of privileges. And they're perfectly happy to have a democratic elected civilian government as long as the military budget is under their control and unquestionable and the distribution of goodies to the officers is not uh, interfered with uh, by the civilians. Now, in the United States, um, despite the, uh, you know, the, the warnings about the military industrial complex that President Eisenhower was so famous for, uh, by and large, I think everyone grants that the military uh, responds to civilian control on a regular, consistent, and desirable uh, basis. That the civilians run and are in charge of our uh, of our military, and that has not been the case in the Muslim world, and will not be the case for a long time uh, for a long time to come. Right now, in Turkey, you're having a massive trial of hundreds of uh, of military officers who are charged either with uh, planning a coup in 2003 or with a criminal conspiracy of more recent vintage called the Ergenekon uh, conspiracy. Um, they're like 300 senior officers uh, under arrest and being tried. Uh, if that trial leads to, the, uh, to guilty verdicts against all those officers, it's just going to be a uh, massive change in the uh, in the structure of security in Turkey. But it may be the government will choose 
to accept, uh, to, to have guilty verdicts, but with minimal sentences, so that uh, they don't completely uh, alienate the officer corps. Um, but, but it's very different from the United States. Uh, civilian control is really the key difference. Yes? I don't hear a lot in our media about Saudi Arabia. What is going on with Saudi Arabia compared to some of the more, uh, what we call Arab Spring states? I don't mm -hmm. hear about a lot of instability in Saudi Arabia. No, no, there's not a lot of uh, instability. Could you speak why, what the difference is? Sure. Um, uh, Saudi Arabia is a, uh, has very, very strong internal uh, security. Um, it has a dual military. It has an army and it has a national guard that are to some degree counterbalanced so that you can, uh, you're guarding against the idea of some sort of a coup. But... Those things aside, the, the key thing in Saudi Arabia is that everybody's getting so damn old. Um, the, the, the sons of King Abdulaziz have rotated into the office of king by order of age for a very long time now. And they're just getting older and older and older. So that, you know, you can say, well, you know, I waited my turn and now... You know, my brother died at 82, but I'm 81, so I want my turn to be king. I mean, um, everybody, every Saudi watcher knows that there is a, um, you know, let's say a, a royal cliff that's somewhere in the, in the near distance. And nobody knows how it's going to be, uh, how it's going to be uh, managed. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's just it's just a mystery. I think everyone in Saudi Arabia wants to have an orderly transition, but they don't know how to do it. Um, presumably, it'll be decided by the Al Saud, by the Saud family, an internal caucus of some sort, but we don't know how that will take place. It's not sure they know how it will take place, but there's a transition coming. Let's say in Oman, to take another example, you have a, uh, a sultan who rules a country and rules it quite well. He's considered a great hero, heroic figure in Oman for reasons that are not entirely uh, you know, warranted by the actual history. Um, he has always refused to marry uh, and sire any, um, any children because he's gay. And uh, he will die without any children. He's not that old. Quite a, quite a handsome man. Um, but, uh, but everybody knows that there will be a problem in Oman uh, down the road. So when you ask a political officer, I remember talking to a political officer in the U.S. Embassy in Oman, I said, well, what will happen then? And he said, oh, well, the family will solve the problem and come up with a successor in its, in its traditional fashion. And then I talked to an anthropologist specializing in Oman who had been approached by a member of the ruling family. And they said, you know, you're an anthropologist, you've studied us. What is our traditional fashion <laughs> of, of choosing a ruler? Because nobody's ever come to power in Oman in the last 200 years without a war, um, without violence. So this is, this is a problem when you get monarchies, is that um, you may not have a turnover of government very often, but managing it is... Uh, is concerned both internally and in terms of, uh, of foreign relations. Saudi is going to have a huge um, turnover. And I don't think the United States has any likelihood of being having a managerial hand in that, in that turnover. Um, I don't know, you may know better than I do uh, uh, about it or you know, any of you who our Saudi watchers may know more, but it's a, I guess, uh, you're the Saudi watcher, aren't you? Well, the uh, origin is those who know aren't talking, and those who are talking don't know. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's difficult with Saudi Arabia to, to really determine what's happening. But I think the key, the key there is how the next generation will move into uh, the, the key positions of power, including the, the royal crown prince. Uh, right now there's a crown prince selected to take over when the king uh, passes from the scene. Uh, 
and the king is 89, and the crown prince is 82, I believe. And at some point, the next generation is going to need to move in. And the, the as, as Professor Bullock uh, described, the, the way it has been up to this point, the, the sons of uh, the founder of Saudi Arabia have shared uh, turns, but the next generation is going to get more difficult given the number of princes that are, that are vying for power. So we really don't know what's going to happen. They, uh, they formed a new uh, structure called the Allegiance uh, Council to, uh, to sort these things out, to determine with family consensus who would be the next crown prince whenever a king passes away, but that uh, system has yet to be tested. There's an old book called From Prince to King by a man named Alexander Bly that, um, that gives you details of how each succession has taken place uh, since the time of Abdulaziz. And it's quite, uh, it's quite detailed, but going back to what Pat said, uh, Alex Bly, who wrote the book, is an Israeli. He never has talked to a Saudi. He's never visited Saudi Arabia. But as an Israeli intelligence uh, officer, he had massive files of newspaper clippings <clears throat> of rumors about the royal family. And the question was, how could he turn this into a doctoral thesis? And I said, well, look, there are people who know, but they won't say. But if you talk to them and you say, I'm not going to quote you on anything. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to tell me anything about the soil, royal family. I'm simply going to read you a series of newspaper clippings. And you can nod or shake your head as to whether you think this was true or false. And um, so by using that, and never having to quote anyone, never having an actual interview, because nobody ever said anything, uh, he was able to sort the wheat from the chaff and come up with actually a good enough book that I've seen the Saudi Consul General in New York um, recommend the book to other people if they want to know how the internal operations of the Saudi family work. But that was 20 years ago. And, um, you know, they weren't as old as they are now. Yes? I guess my question, what is the, what do you think the impact is of uh, Iran with nuclear weapons? We hear that all the time in the media, it comes back and forth, and is it a destabilization of the area or upset the apple cart in any way? Uh, Iran has does not have nuclear weapons, has not, so far as anybody is aware, made a decision to have nuclear weapons. Right. The Supreme Guide has condemned possession of nuclear weapons, and yet there is a realistic and recurrent fear that Iran could have nuclear weapons. Right. Okay. Now, there's a question of what do you do with a nuclear weapon if you have it? And do you, for example, if you have one? Let's say you have two. Hey. Let's say you have four, and Israel has 200. Do you initiate a war that would result in a counter strike that would destroy your country? Um, the rationality that we became accustomed to uh, during the Cold War of mutually assured destruction would say that if you are a weak nuclear power, you do not initiate a war against a strong nuclear power because um, you will be destroyed. The problem is that Iran is so far behind everybody else who has nuclear weapons that it's very hard to see any use they would have for them at all, except for national pride. And that can't be discounted. Um, I was in Pakistan a few years ago, and I was talking about their nuclear weapons. Well, actually, I wasn't. I was talking about uh, Iran, uh, Pakistan's pathetic economic performance. And I said, you know, the Indian Institute of Technology produces these really great engineers and scientists, and they're helping push, in, push India into the ranks of the leading countries of the world. And in Pakistan, you don't have any of that, despite the fact that you come from the same background. And prior to partition, you were part of the same country. You don't have any of that dynamism. And the response was, we have nuclear weapons. Um, and any country with nuclear weapons is the equivalent of any of the, of the greatest countries in the world because we have nuclear weapons, even if they have no, no practical use for them. Now, in the case of Pakistan, they came very close to a nuclear war with India in 03. Uh, so it doesn't mean that they're not without danger. 
uh, and, and what I heard recently was that the um, prime minister of or the, the prime minister of India asked his intelligence people. He said, "Can we go into Pakistan and seize all of their nuclear weapons before they use them?" Um, and the response was, um, "Pakistan has 14 bombs, and we know where 13 of them are." And so they decided they would not have an action against Pakistan because the 14th weapon, um, they didn't know where it was and they didn't want New Delhi blown up. Well, so there, you know, balance of power means something. Now, if you talk to people on the alarmist uh, right in Israel, which is pretty much the majority of the government, they will say, well, Iran wants to attack Israel with nuclear weapons, even if it means suicide, uh, because they follow a religion that says that this will be a, um, uh, a great credit to them religiously. Um, by my count, there are about three Israelis who actually know anything about Islamic religion in Iran. Uh, Zev Magen, and you know, I, I won't name them, but you know, I, I've been an external reviewer in all of the Middle East history programs in Israeli universities. They don't have specialists on Iran. Uh, and they, are, they have no, no grasp of what Iranian religious views are. They simply assert what they are. And in some cases, in ways that are quite uh, quite ridiculous. Um, they say, well, you know, in, in Islamic belief, the coming of the Messiah will be enhanced or, or, or accelerated by killing the Jews. There, there's nothing in Islamic belief, either Sunni or Shiite, that maintains that. Um, the notion, oddly enough, the notion of the end times of the world that are, that's most influential among Israelis is the, comes from the book of Revelation, not from the Quran or from any of the Muslim sources. You read Muslim sources about the end of the world. And um, what happens at the end of the world? Well, you have a great tyrant who, who comes, who's uh, the Antichrist, or the Dajjal, as you call it in Arabic. What happens to the Antichrist? Well, somebody has to fight against him. Who is that person who fights against him in Muslim belief, both Sunni and Shiite? Jesus Christ. Um, Muslims and Christians agree that Jesus comes at the end of the world and that Jesus fights against the Antichrist. Um, now, Jesus, in Muslim belief, in most versions of it, uh, kills the Antichrist with a spear. And in the version of it that I, I think is the most telling after he kills the Antichrist with a spear, he goes to Jerusalem. Now, if Jerusalem is simply a crater in the ground full of radiation, this is going to be hard to pull off. But he goes to Jerusalem, and he goes to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and he gets in the line of people praying behind an imam, and that imam is the Messiah. So Jesus is the one who actually identifies the, the Messiah in this version of, of the Muslim end times. But, but if you talk to, to Israelis about what do you actually know about Shiite Islam or about Sunni Islam, uh, that would lead you to this belief in a, in a murderous fanaticism. Uh, it, it, it's very, very sad to find the level of ignorance that prevails among people who are um, threatening to engulf not only their country in Iran, but our country in another war. My view is that Iran has no use for the weapons, should not acquire the weapons, but if they do acquire the weapons, there's nothing they can do with them. Now, some people say, well, they would give them to terrorists. Yeah, well, probably not. Most of the terrorists are Sunnis, for one thing. You don't want to hand over a nuclear weapon to Al-Qaeda and have, the, have it be used against Tehran. Um, you'd think, oh, that was a blunder. Um, so it's all uh, so sketchy and so hypothetical that I, I can't 
bring myself to worry about Iranian nuclear weapons at all. And as for destabilizing region and getting everyone else to, to try and build nuclear weapons, I don't think that would happen. Speaking of... Uh... I was curious as to the modernization theory that you talked about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to what extent do you think that still influences our foreign policy? And, and one example I have in mind is, is the uh, the Iranian nuclear issue. You know, we have uh, the Ayatollahs who keep coming out over and over and over again, and, and you know, with these religious judgments, that say we don't want nuclear weapons, we don't believe in them. It's a sin. We'll never have nuclear weapons. It's an abomination. But you know, our administration just really seems to ignore that, as if, as if a religious edict like that could have no bearing whatsoever on Iran's political agenda. So, you know, are we still under, under the influence of that sort of modernization theory? No, that's a matter of being under the influence of, um, of uh, trying to keep Israel from dragging us into a war. Um, the, the question of who to believe in Iran is uh, is approached by different parties in a completely self-interested fashion. So sometimes you believe what Ahmadinejad says, and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you believe what Khamenei says, and sometimes you don't, depending on what suits your particular interest. When Mr. Ahmadinejad leaves office next summer, um, we're, we're going to miss him. Say, well, why don't we have old Ahmadinejad to kick around anymore? Uh, because it's unlikely that whoever follows him will be the sort of international big mouth that he has been. And that means that there's a greater likelihood that people will have to pay attention to, uh, to the, uh, the Rahbar, the, the Supreme Guide, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, because they won't have a president who is in that um, high profile um, position. But as far as modernization theory, your underlying question goes, uh, I think modernization theory was the primary uh, conceptual basis of the war in Iraq. And that it's interesting. You know, I have great respect for people who work for the US government um, in foreign policy areas. They, that they work their tails off. They have huge inboxes, huge outboxes. A lot of it is total nonsense, but they have to move it every day. They work late, they go home tired. They don't spend a lot of time reading books. So the result is that their, their theoretical con, you know, their theoretical furniture is very often what they picked up in graduate school. Well, now it's five years old, now it's 10 years old, now it's 15 years old, now it's 20 years old. You look at the age of the policymakers in the, uh, in the Bush administration, and you think, well, these guys really learned how the world worked in the 1960s. And the fact that the world doesn't work that way and that the big theories were wrong, they've never revised it. And it's just shocking how little the American government wanted to know about Iraq uh, when it was prepared to, uh, to invade. Uh, probably the two best Iraq specialists in the US government um, were uh, Judith Yaffe and Phoebe Marr at the uh, National Defense University. Did anybody ever call them and say, you know, what's it like in Iraq? Nope. They were frozen out because there's this theory that we would have a completely new group of people who would be change agents, who would bring the modern world to Iraq. And we didn't have to know anything about what existed in Iraq. We were going to start over with something much better and that there would be certain Iraqi exiles, uh, Mr. Alawi and Mr. Chelebi, who would, um, who are favorites of the CIA or of the Pentagon, and they would be the leaders. Uh, now, that notion of, of a technocratic leader, friendly to the West, who would bring modernity, uh, you, could, you could go back to a book like um, uh, Manfred Halpern's uh, Political Development and Social Change in the Middle East and North Africa, published in I think 1958 or so, and you can find exactly his prediction as a modernization theorist as to how change comes about. You bring in military officers, you bring in technocrats, and they completely change the world and you really don't care about anything else. And I think that that was 
the um, you know the theoretical you know conceptual furniture that the uh, uh, the people who led us into war in Iraq were were dealing with. Now I happen to think that war would have been fought regardless of whether Al Gore or uh, or Bush was elected. That there was a universal uh, passion to kill Saddam um, one way or another. But uh, so I'm not saying that the war was was a huge Republican error or um, or even that it was something that shouldn't have taken place. But the way it was done was was so retarded. It was just uh, embarrassing from the point of view of anyone who was a specialist.